Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Uh, I've spent mm, probably eight years, but more specifically the last six months working on a topic that is referred to as corner crossing. Mostly I'm interested in when public and private property intersect or have adjacent boundaries. Where do the property rights start and end for each party? Where do they merge? When does one have precedent over the other, if at all? So rather than me rely on everything I read on the internet, rather than me listening to the guys down at the coffee shop, I hired attorneys. I hired people specializing in this stuff. And we did two podcasts, which We've got another podcast, so there will end up being at least three podcast episodes out of this. And this is the first one. The first of these episodes is just the background of how this happened. I'm looking at my map. How did we get here? How did all this checkerboard start? What, what are the contributing factors? What are all the trends? There's a lot of trends going on, a lot of changes. You know, everyone wants to focus on the bad hunter or the bad landowner where there's a lot of stuff in between that's just everybody trying to figure it out. But you'll hear us make reference through both podcasts of a case in Wyoming that popped up. I had no idea it was going to pop up, but it's really relevant. So we use it for reference a lot. So this first podcast episode is a whole lot of background, about an hour of background. And then the second podcast that you're going to see or listen to is two or two plus hours of attorneys explaining this and why it's not as cut and dried as someone, well, some would want us to think, oh, this is open shut. Get out of here. It's not. And so that's what we're going to get into with the second podcast. So this is the first podcast of the two. And We'll do another video that you'll be able to go see the second podcast. So listen to this background. I think it's going to be helpful as you try to understand this big legal discussion that happens in the next podcast. Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Welcome to Loopold's Hunt Talk Radio. Is Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. To be more precise, this is episode number 178. And uh, after many years of discussion, uh, legal fees, consultation with attorneys, it's time to jump into one of the hot topics of our time. Some people call it corner crossing. I call it the intersection of private and public property rights. And yeah, it does happen where corners meet. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little more detail. Uh, today is the first of two episodes that we've recorded on corner crossing. And when these two episodes air, um, I know for sure we'll end up with a third episode and maybe even a fourth episode. And I think the third episode is going to be based on a lot of feedback we get and a bunch of stuff that doesn't get covered in episode number two. Uh, and the fourth episode is probably just going to be a continuing discussion based on how, how this is evolving right now. Um, but this is the first episode. And in this episode, I'm going to go into a bunch of background that I think is going to be super helpful for the episode that we're going to launch uh, in a few days. And that'll be episode number 179. But before I do that, I want to quickly thank the partners, the sponsors who make this 
podcast possible. And uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to uh, have these long discussions like this. And this one is, <laughs> this one's been a lot of work. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful that we have companies that support us in our efforts of doing this. Uh, Leupold Optics, uh, they're the title sponsor of this and a lot of other things that we do. Go to leupold.com, uh, check out all their optics and know that when you buy Leupold products, you are supporting a family held business that strongly supports the things we love like hunting, shooting, conservation, access, and the list goes on and on. And another family held company that does the same in its support of, of hunting and shooting is Nosler. Nosler Ammunition has been around for a long time. If you're interested in ammunition or components, go to nosler.com, check out what they have. Uh, and there now, it's it's getting to the point where you can start buying a lot of the stuff right off their website. So nosler.com is where you'll find it. Mystery Ranch Backpacks. Uh, Mystery Ranch has been with us forever. Um, if you want to save... 10% on one of these amazing backpacks, uh, here's how you do it. You go to the Go Hunt gear shop. In other words, go to gohunt.com, uh, click on shop, and put one of these packs in your cart. And when you check out using promo code Randy, they're going to give you 10% off that pack and just about every other regularly priced item that's in your cart. So go there and use promo code Randy. Uh, my good friend, Corey Jacobson, produces the University of Elk Hunting. And he's offered that anybody who signs up for his University of Elk Hunting using promo code Randy can save 20 bucks. Go out to elk101.com, sign up for the course, and get more elk information than you probably even knew was out there. Uh, it's application season right now. We're in the heat of it. And we use Go Hunts Insider for all of that, for research, for draw odds, for planning, for e-scouting, for maps, you name it. If you want all of that, go out there, uh, sign up for Insider at GoHunt.com. Use promo code Randy when, when you sign up, and they're going to give you $50 of credit, like mad money, in their gear shop. And then we have our new Fresh Tracks Plus platform. It's a subscription platform that uh, hopefully... Uh, a lot of you find interesting because we it's ad free we don't do anything with your information like all these other platforms and uh, we've got a lot of exclusive stuff and stuff goes out there way before it ever hits the rest of our platform so go to freshtracks.tv and uh, hopefully we can convince you to to sign up but I want to get into this first episode here and give a lot of background for what will be in episodes two and eventually episodes three. Uh, in this first episode, I want to explain what corner crossing is. I know most of you probably know that, uh, but I want to make sure everybody knows that. I want to talk about how it's becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, and I'll touch on a few of the legal concepts that are going to be discussed in three days when we release episode number 179. Uh, that'll drop on March 7th, 2022. Uh, I'll just touch on them, though. I'm not going to get into the details. When we release the next part of this series, episode two, I'm going to have two guests who are both attorneys that I've been working with for a long time, uh, Tom Stonecipher and Nick Vandenboss, and they're the ones who are going to get into the details. And that's going to happen in episode two. But I think in this first episode, uh, I, I tried to put this episode as the introduction to uh, what's now episode number two. And I ended up with such a long, long episode. Uh, the intro took forever. The intro, uh, Andrew McKeon, who was listening to this uh, as one of my kind of extra ears, he's like, Randy, you had to make this two episodes. Oh, yeah. Good idea, Andrew. So <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, so in this first episode, you're just going to get me. And it's me giving some explanation of my journey through this very complicated topic, what I've learned, and what I think is useful in trying to understand the many facets that pop up in a discussion that revolves around this intersection of something that we all hold dear. We're talking about property rights. And in the case of corners or corner crossing, 
It's the intersection of private property rights and public property rights. So with that, the first question becomes, what is corner crossing? And for those of you not familiar, uh, I'm going to give you a quick background uh, that'll help you visualize the topic when we get into a bunch of fine details in this podcast or the next podcast. So imagine you're looking at a surface ownership map of the West. Uh, In the West, white is private, BLM is yellow, uh, green is forest service, but If you've ever looked at a a checkerboard, right, you got red and black squares on that checkerboard. Well, every other square is red, and the ones in between are black. And the corners are where these squares of red and black intersect. In in other words, they're all touching at the same place. And if you looked at it, in the lower left will be red, in the upper right will be red. But in the lower right will be black and the upper left will be black. So you have this weird pattern. And that's why we call this checkerboard because we have a very similar thing that plays out in the West where instead of red and black, it's white and yellow or white and green. And what it is, is every other section is public, private, public, private. And as you'll hear, it gets into some pretty interesting issues. Um... Uh, the, these surface maps end up looking like a checkerboard, but just with different colors. So at issue is how do we access these diagonally adjacent pieces of public land? Let's say you're going from a red square on your checkerboard to another red square, or you're, uh, if the public is the black, you're going from a black square to another black square. But where they all meet, you got private land uh, adjacent to you. So the real topic we have to cover is how do we access these pieces of public land without trespassing on the intersecting pieces of private land? So corner crossing, it's a term you hear often, uh, especially out in the West. It's an action when a public citizen tries to do just what I described. The, the, the person crosses from one piece of public land to another piece of pub, public land without stepping on the property of the two adjacent pieces of private land that they all intersect. All four parcels intersect at one point. So in this podcast and in the upcoming podcast, you're going to hear us refer to a case in Wyoming currently being litigated in Carbon County where four non-resident hunters did just that. They crossed from public to public at diagonal corners. They did what's called corner crossing. And they used a stepladder. I mean, they really went out of their way to make sure they did not touch the property of the two private pieces that would have been on their left and right as they stepped over the corner pin. So they used a stepladder. In other words, if you think of an upside down V where one leg of the stepladder is on public and they lean it over the corner pin onto another piece of public. So they used a stepladder at this marked corner. And you think about, okay, you walk up one side. When you're walking up one part of it, you're still on BLM land. You go over the top of the stepladder and you climb down the other side. And when you climb down, you're on BLM land. So they went over the marker and they did this without ever placing a foot on the ground of the two adjacent sections of private land. So uh, I throw that out there for some background because it's a really timely case that I did not know was going to pop up when I started all this. But the case is being litigated as we speak. As we're recording these podcasts down in Wyoming, uh, there's this case going on. And it's a fact pattern that's very similar to what a lot of people think. Now, it's not the first time hunters have crossed at corners. This has been going on a lot. Uh, And many times it's not even a concern because a lot of landowners, they will allow access at the corner so long as you stay on public. Sometimes people do it and they didn't have permission, but no citation was issued and 
There's been times where a citation was issued, but the charges got dropped. And in this process, we've found cases where hunters crossed at a location that was not even close to the corner. And they said they were crossing at a corner, but they were off by 100, 200 yards. Well, guess what? They got a citation, they were found guilty, and they paid the fine, as they should. So when we're talking corner crossing, we're not talking about, oh, you know, anywhere within 100 yards is good enough. No, we're talking about this absolute finite little spot where four parcels come together. So um, we don't know what the outcome of the Wyoming case is at this time. Uh, We don't know what it will be. Um, It might get dropped. You never know. So maybe we won't even have a finding in that case. Uh, But given that case makes for a useful and timely reference in this discussion, in this podcast, and in episode two, and what will be episode three, I think it's helpful to explain what occurred there and what happened to the hunters. So I've already explained what occurred. In other words, what the hunters did. They went in from, they used the step ladder to go across this corner uh, for the purposes of elk and deer hunting. Now, here's what happened to them. Uh, The out-of-state landowner who owns the two private parcels, multiple private parcels. So this is in an area where there's tons of checkerboard. So this out-of-state landowner, He demanded that the local sheriff press charges for criminal trespass, which the the county sheriff did. And now the county attorney is prosecuting these four hunters with trespass under Wyoming criminal statute. And I say I emphasize criminal because in the next podcast, you're going to hear a big difference between criminal statute and civil claim. So... The other thing that happened is in the last two weeks, the out-of-state landowner also filed a civil claim, a claim for civil trespass against these four hunters, and this out-of-state landowner is seeking damages for the actions of these hunters. So in the next podcast with Tom and Nick, the two attorneys, uh, we'll explain, or not we, they will explain the difference between civil and criminal trespass, because there's two big distinctions under the law. In that, we'll also talk about the legal theories, uh, including there, there's a doctrine out there called the ad coelum doctrine. We're going to talk about that a lot because it's a legal theory of common law that's, I think, more than 700 years old. And it states that the surface owner can make a claim to everything from hell below to the heavens above. And uh, in the next uh, podcast, I'll, I'll let Tom and Nick get into the details of how that theory came to be. I think all of us will understand why some would want that to be the law of the land. But Tom and Nick have, have done a ton of research along with three uh, law professors who specialize in this stuff. And I think they're going to give us a lot of information about why many courts have rejected this legal theory of ad coelum due to its impracticality for how property is held and how it's used in today's world. So, uh, I think for some background, uh, maybe I should even throw this in there for today's episode. Uh, There's a history of how this issue of corner corner crossing became a hot topic button in Western public land access. And that history goes all the way back to the 1850s. And that is when the U.S. government decided it would be a good idea to encourage railroads to build rail lines that would go deep into the western frontier. And in the process, encouraging development, creating towns along the way, uh, there was incentives given to do just that. Now, if you really want to see where it's at play, get a surface map and follow Interstate 80 across the southern part of Wyoming, and you're going to see the results of this policy going back to the 1850s. And the reason you'll see it so clearly is I-80 pretty much follows the railroad path for a couple hundred miles. And right in the middle of south central Wyoming 
in this checkerboard area is Carbon County, which is where this case I referred to earlier stems from. So, in addition to railroads, land grants from the federal government were made to timber companies, to homesteaders, to miners. States were provided isolation, isolated sections of land uh, in Montana. The states, upon statehood, uh, were granted section 16 and 36 within every township. And that was given to the states to help fund their school systems. And they're the little powder blue sections that show up on your map. Uh, yet all that together and the land ownership pattern that started with 1.8 billion acres of public land and now has us down to 640 million acres. So about a third of it is left. Uh, it kind of looks like this disjointed, uh, <laughs> who the heck thought of this idea, uh, is, is kind of what you see when you look at some of it. Uh, but with that history, it, it, I hope it gives people the understanding that it's not like somebody in today, you know, any of our land management agencies said, oh boy, we'd really like to have a checkerboard. Uh, no, it's just how it happened 170 years ago. And back then, not much concern was given to the idea of access, you know, uh, what might be trespass or whether criminal or civil trespass. Uh, and I don't think anybody could have imagined what our country, our economy, all the things that would have evolved today and how this property ownership pattern would complicate a lot of that. So there is a history to how we find ourselves where we are. Uh, and right now we're talking about, I think the last study I saw was like uh, the conservative side is 1.5 million acres of public land or as high as 1.65 million acres of public land are either accessible slash inaccessible as a result of what legacy this history has left us, this really strange land ownership pattern that we call checkerboard. So that's a lot of land that we're talking about. Now, with, with that background of government policy that created much of this checkerboard pattern, I, I think it's also worth it to roll forward the, the hands of time uh, and explore the changes in land ownership trends in the West that has probably brought one, at least one of the contributing factors that has brought the idea of public-private property rights and their intersection uh, even more important today. So I would say in the last, oh, maybe 30 years, certainly the last 20 years, we've had a trend of long-time working ranches. Uh, these were legacy ranches that were handed down from generation to generation. And many of them had interwoven this checkerboard pattern of private land, you know, public, private, public, private. And these legacy ranches had been in families for many generations. And many of them allowed public access to the public parcels inside their private lands. Some of them even went so far as to say, yeah, you know, you can access my private land. Uh, and so long as hunters behaved well and treated the land with respect, a lot of the landowners were happy to let the public have access to their public lands. So I think you could say that was the case 20 or 30 years ago. Now, here's a trend that's been happening. And this is just a function of living in a society of, you know, where people are successful. Uh, over the last three decades, many of these working ranches are, they, they no longer have anyone to pass the ranch to. Uh, no family members. And, and let's face it, ranching is hard work and it has a ton of risk. So many times the kids, you know, they go to town, they go off to college, they go to trade school, whatever. And they look back and say, man, I, I don't know if I want to work that hard and take that amount of risk and do so for the small returns often provided from a working ranch. And so with nobody to take over the ranch, it ends up getting sold. And very often it's sold to an outside party and often is sold for the amenities of the ranch. 
So uh, here's what we have, right? Many of these ranches that we see that have been sold or that are on the market today are remarkable properties where I, I'd say the great stewardship of a lot of these landowners has resulted in really, really good wildlife habitat. Well, you got amenity buyers. Uh, you know, sometimes we jokingly refer to them as the billionaires, but it, it could be anybody who's looking for those amenities, okay? They're looking for a great, great piece of property with wildlife, with open space, with amazing views, and they're willing to pay a lot for these properties. So we end up with a sale that often has a new landowner coming from another state, coming from another place, and they probably have some different perspectives on allowing public access, whether public access across corners, public access through their property to get to places that historically, you know, hunters have been able to, yeah, go up on the mountain, just stay up there, you know, close the gate, that kind of stuff. So this trend of new out-of-state amenity landowners uh, now owning what I call working ranches is a trend that's been accelerating and I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. Uh, and so more and more acreage and often huge acreages just in one purchase is transferring to these successful people, uh, who are, they, they don't have to depend on the ranch operations for their livelihood. I mean, let's face it, if, if I have a very large portfolio and uh, of stock, bonds, you know, whatever, income-producing real estate, I'm not really worried about the market price of cows that day. I, I, I've got another, another source of income. Uh, so it, just that in itself creates a different type of, of view, a, a different life experience that's going to create a different view of, of what this ranch means to the new owner compared to how it was held and how the prior owner viewed all this. Uh, these new landowners, they often come from, like I said, from a different place, a different state. Uh, they, you know, they might come from a place with a completely different land ethos, uh, and a different idea about public access, about what neighborhood or neighbor really is. I mean, uh, there's, there's just different perspectives uh, that new people are going to bring when you see a large transfer. I'm talking about a really large transfer in terms of acreage from formerly working ranches where a lot of this was easy to, I don't want to say easy, but, you know, historically had been sorted out pretty well. You know, we all saw each other at the coffee shop or the kids went to school together. You saw them at church or at the basketball game or whatever. Uh, it's, it's not that easy anymore. And I will say that just the way these properties are marketed uh, changes how a buyer thinks of what, you know, what they own or what they control based on what they were told they were buying. And we've all seen the ads, right? And it's like something to this effect. Buy 6,000 acres and control access to 12,000 acres. And it implies that buying the 6,000 private acres allows you to control access to another 6,000 public acres. And if you're a buyer who doesn't know any different and you're new to the West, or maybe you know better, uh, this sounds like a really good deal, right? It seems like I'm getting a 50% discount on the purchase price. Uh, I will say very often the new buyers aren't aware of the complications that could come when all of a sudden they find out they've got this interwoven mix of private and public. And so, you know, sometimes it's just out of naivety, uh, lack of knowledge, uh, or sometimes uh, lack of due diligence where some of this starts. So I would say this trend of land ownership change is one of the factors. Now, I'm going to throw another factor in here that might piss off a few listeners, but it's something we got to talk about. And it's a factor that has complicated hunting access to private lands and also complicated how private landowners look at hunters. Uh, and so 
at the same time or simultaneous to this trend I identified in traditional working ranchers now being owned by amenity buyers, uh, we've had an increasing trend in the hunting world where hunters are ignorant of what's expected when you're interacting with landowners or how you treat their property, uh, what the do's and don'ts are. And then we sometimes have hunters who are just jerks about it. Uh, and, uh, their interaction with private landowners is completely inappropriate. Uh, and I know sometimes hunters are going to say, yeah, but it's just a small group of those assholes that are doing that. And that's likely correct. But that doesn't do anything for the landowner who has to deal with the consequences of some hunters being assholes. So even if it's just 2% of hunters who are jerks, when you have 10,000 hunters afield, that's 200 jerks out there causing a lot of headaches for landowners. Now, we take my home state of Montana, we sell closer to 100,000 hunting licenses. And I don't know if 2% is a high number, a low number, but let's just say if it is 2%. That's 2,000 jerks out there. That's a lot of bad actors causing landowners to get to the point where they just detest hunting season. And with hunting season comes a lot of problems, a lot of impact to them, their time, and their operations. So, you know... A hunter need to accept that's also a reality as we start mixing this whole pot of access and where access to public now becomes even more important as we lose access to private because of some of these jerks. And I'm here to tell you that when landowners voice their concerns about hunters and I'll call it fatigue of hunting, hunting season fatigue because of how long the seasons are, they're not making this stuff up. You know, we've got, it, well, even having one ignorant moron among us is too many, but we know it. We, we've got too many among us who have no understanding of what a rancher is going through with the three month long hunting season. Uh, I mean, put yourself in the rancher's shoes, right? They've been great stewards. They got wonderful property. So the habitat on their private ground, just that's going to attract a lot of wildlife. They probably have some of the best water resources, which in the arid west is going to attract even more wildlife. So then you add in some states, like my home state of Montana, we have ridiculously long hunting seasons. So that continuous hunting pressure pushes the animals from public onto private, further complicating this issue because people drive by and most animals are behind the, you know, the private land fence and there's not many left on public. Well, again, these are things that a hunter's got to take some responsibility for. And, you know, a rancher's got a business to run. He, he doesn't have time to stop for every hunter who drives down the ranch road to ask for permission. You know, at least in Montana, we sell most our cows in the fall. Most our calves, we sort them. Steers are getting sorted, and they end up getting shipped, usually in October. Uh, so the last thing this guy needs, he or she needs, is a group of hunters, you know, however well-intended, stopping by to just sort of shoot the breeze about, you know, what's going on. Uh, and they got work to do. So, yeah, that on top of hunters calling at bad hours, you know, calling early in the morning, calling late at night, knocking out on doors. Uh, and none of that even touches on the bad behavior of trespassing, damage to road, weed issues, gates left open, heaven forbid, vandalism of their property. So I give all that to say there's multiple things that are increasing the demand for access to public lands. And sometimes that access is complicated by this checkerboard mix. Uh, and so we got a lot of trends at work here. Um, we as hunters got to accept, you know, kind of how we're contributing to that um, and see what we do. You know, uh, the, the things I look at is, okay, this type of behavior, 
uh, by hunters and these trends are reducing access to private lands. It increases the crowding on public lands. I mean, the kind of one results in the other. And both of these, the, these trends direct more attention to the access of public lands because we're feeling more crowded. So we look and say, well, there's some public land over there. If I could just step over this corner or we could find a way to get to that public land, it wouldn't be as crowded. It'd alleviate some of the pressure. So uh, I I think all of us who know landowners and live in these areas, we understand the headache that hunting season brings for them. And here, here's a point I, why I spent a lot of time talking about this. Most of us who understand what a headache hunting is for ranchers, and, and I fall into this category, we avoid even asking to hunt on these private lands, even if we know the landowners, because we understand what they're going through and we don't want to be a contributor to that problem. We fully respect their private property and their time. So we focus almost exclusively on the public lands. It's like, all right, yep, those are your lands. Do with them what you want. You got enough to deal with. You don't need us. We're going to go here and we're going to hunt public land and we're going to respect your private property rights. We hope that everybody, you know, respects the public property right. So uh, I... I think this idea of hunters, sometimes I I think this is disregarded in, in the hunting space and in this discussion is there's a lot of hunters who make this affirmative statement. And I call it an affirmative appreciation by hunters for the private property rights and for the time of that landowner that I think a lot of people overlook that, but I take it pretty seriously uh, that many hunters are doing that out of respect for the landowners, what they're going through, and for the fact that they respect private property rights. So we just go to the public trailhead, and we know it's going to be more crowded. We know it's going to be tougher, but we it, it kind of follows with who we are, right? We don't want to be that person who adds to the problem. We don't want to come across as not respecting someone's rights or someone's time. So we make this decision that, all right, that's your property. The public is property for us to go and enjoy. Let's respect each other. And off we go. Uh, and I, I bring that up. I'm, I'm trying to connect all those dots because I hope everybody understands that there's not a ton of hunters driving around just saying, boy, I really, I, I got to figure out a way to get to that person's private property. No, most of the hunters I know are like, oh yeah, that's a cool place, but you know, it's their land. I'm going to let them do their thing. I'm going to go here. I respect their property. Hopefully they respect the public property and uh, let's, uh, let's make it work. So, uh, I, I, I'm adding a lot of things together here, but it's bringing us, all these are converging to a point where, you got some trends that are that are kind of coming to a point. You have the intersection of some property rights, you know, the public right, the the private right that's all coming to a point. Uh, and so you do all that, uh, and we're going to end up with a lot of increase in public recreationists wanting to find ways to legally access public lands, including these checkerboard public lands. So again, this leads us to where there's an intersection of property boundaries. There is also an intersection of property rights, and it could be at the corners, but it can also be where public and private share long adjacent boundaries. Uh, These are places... Uh, you know, or I, I try to think about, uh, I hope I pointed and painted a good visual because these are the places where hunters can access other public lands without bothering or interfering with the adjacent private landowner. You know, the hunter is just saying, hey, just let me get to that BLM land. I, I don't want to put a foot on your private land. 
I just want to get over there, step over this corner. I, you know, that the, the, you do yours, I'll do mine. Is kind of what I think a lot of most of all the hunters I talk to. That's all they're looking for is I just want to go do that. So you get hunters wanting to do that because of all the pressures and all the changes I mentioned. And now we end up with this trend going back to the land ownership trend. Uh, we, we have landowners coming from a different place with a different land ethic. And like I said, some of them may have been told that state law allows them to control public access in these instances. Well, when you have millions of acres of public land held in these this arrangement, you know, I only I think it's only reasonable to expect that the public would work to find ways to access those public lands and try to do so and want to do so without interfering with the adjacent private landowner. And I think that's what these non-resident hunters in Wyoming did. They said, hey, we don't want to mess with this private landowner. That's his. You know, he do with it what he wants. We're just going over this corner. So I hope all of that provides some background of how we got here. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to provide a few pieces about my journey. And, and when I say my journey, what I mean is what I'm learning along the way and what considerations I've given that influence how I approach this topic. Uh, for me, and I often get accused of giving deference to private property rights more so than public property rights. And I suspect that's probably a fair criticism at times, even though I'm a really big public land advocate. Uh, we all want to show respect for property, property rights. And in our society, the discussion of property rights most often is framed from the perspective of the private property owner, not from the lens of the collective rights that come with public ownership. So I, you know, if any of you have ever accused me of that, I'm, I'm here to say, yeah, I've, I've probably given the default position to the private side, even though they're equal, they're a mirror of each other. Uh, I, 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 that, that, that's just a bias I've had in, in who I am as, you know, who, who I've always been as a person. So, um, and I, and I give that background cause I think it's relevant to me discussing how this journey for me has, has happened. Now in 2014, I engaged a law firm to advise me because I'd planned to do almost exactly what the non-resident hunters did in the Wyoming court case that's currently being litigated. Uh, and I'm glad I, I hired a law firm because it was beneficial to get a much deeper understanding of property law and the priority of law and Along with that was really helpful is, okay, they, they asked me, Randy, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, I told them, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to get this clarified. You know, there, it seems to be gray. I'd, I'd like some clarification. And they said, well, it's only clarified if the legislature doesn't do something to change it. And even then, it, you know, it's precedent and it's very small precedent. So you're trying to do something that isn't going to make a hill of beans difference of what you you think you're doing. So in that process... If there, there's old saying, you don't know what you don't know. Well, I did not know how little I knew about the complexities of this issue. So as such, since that time, I've never corner crossed and I've never advocated for the idea, knowing that there was a lot of nuance, a lot of intricacy, and that I still had a lot to learn. So now we roll forward the calendar for me, seven years, the summer of 2021. I started talking about this issue, not just in terms of corner crossing, but public, private property rights and where they intersect with the law firm that, that Nick and Tom work for. And they've done a ton of property work for me uh, and for the trust that I represent as a CPA. So from my discussions with them and one of their now retired partners, came the idea that we should make a deep dive into the legal issues surrounding corner crossing and make a series of podcasts around that topic. 
So that's kind of how we got here. Right now, we've recorded two podcasts, this being the first. Uh, in three days, uh, next Monday, we're launching the second. Uh, and the third is going to be crafted on the feedback that we get from listeners uh, based on the first two episodes. And we know we couldn't cover everything in, in part number two. So the third podcast is going to be time to explore topics that we really didn't get into. Uh, and some of the topics that we won't be able to get into would be uh, eminent domain, easement by necessity, prescriptive easements from historic use, what incentives are being used, legislative efforts towards clarification of this, what will be the reaction of state legislatures, depending on how the corner crossing issue does or doesn't get solved in Wyoming, uh, will the issues be solved based on federal law? Because if it's, if the cases are solved on federal law, it's harder for legislatures to circumvent. Uh, what will be the response by landowners who, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of them currently provide access or they're enrolled in a public access program. Uh, so they're providing private and, or maybe just access to the public lands. So I, I think it's worth talking about is what is the net sum gain or the net sum loss that will come from the efforts? And are there ways that we can do this? Is, 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 are there thoughts about, you know, as this topic is approached, you know, the manner in which we do it sometimes can be as, as helpful or harmful as the actual outcome. And, uh, those will be great things to, to talk about in a third podcast. Now, some of you might ask, Randy, why would you put so much time, so much money and effort into a podcast series on this topic? Well, to me, this topic is something that's really interesting to me. And by that, I mean the intersection of not, more, not just these adjacent properties. It's the intersection of many things that are kind of rising to the top as it relates to Western hunting and public land access. Those being property rights, hunter behavior, crowding, the impacts that season types and season settings, the trends where we're transferring critical lands from working ranches to either developers or maybe to buyers who are just, you know, out-of-state folks looking for these amenities that the, the ranch has. And to me, this complex puzzle of how we make all this work while sorting out the legal issues is fascinating. And I think it's super important to me and from what I hear of the audience, it's super important to all of you. So I'm pretty sure most of you are, are kind of like me. You have a personal ethos that is deeply rooted in property rights, both private property rights and public property rights. So you probably want more information on these topics. And I'm interested in information from experts, the people who know, not the person who you read on Facebook or the person down at the coffee shop, but true legal experts. And that's why I'm willing to pay attorneys for that expertise. Tom and Nick have been a huge help over these last six months. And lucky for me, they've leaned on their relationships they have with legal scholars on this topic. There are three law professors who specialize in public land law who have been helping them, and I'm thankful for all of them. So kind of what has come from my seven, eight-year journey is really this. It's a better understanding of how complex the topic is and understanding that the law is an ever-changing body, almost like an organism that evolves to meet the demands that society has of it. I mean, if, if we didn't ever have to change a law, if everything was, okay, this, you know, this house set in stone, never to be changed, nothing, you know, society, the economy, nothing's going to change. We wouldn't need Congress. We wouldn't need legislatures. We probably wouldn't need court. So I've come to learn how much law is, is ever changing. So, uh, Regardless of how corner crossing gets resolved, 
if it ever gets resolved with clarity, none of this happens in a vacuum, right? For every action on either side of the fence, there will likely be reactions. And I can't predict what those actions or, or what the reactions will be. So I, uh, like I said earlier, I, I gave this to Andrew McKean uh, and asked him for, uh, for his thoughts on how all of this got put together. Um, and it was, uh, it, it's always helpful when you ask Andrew to do something in his normal fashion, you know, he sees this big picture with a lot of clarity because he wears a lot of hats. He talks to a lot of people. Uh, he posed a lot of questions to me and he made some comments that are very relevant. And this observation that he left me with was it, it was pretty striking to me as being very applicable to what we're talking about. And I'm going to quote him here. He said, Randy, there's a reason the Wyoming case has the details it does. Non-resident hunters pushing the issue with an absentee landowner. It's because the parties don't know each other. They don't raise their kids together or have to live in the same community and have probably never had a conversation. And many tighter-knit communities of Montana, and I'm guessing the wider West, it's not quite the intractable issue that you might describe. And I guess uh, the reason that struck me is, uh, one, is observation that it's two non-residents uh, or two groups of non uh, non-resident landowner and non-resident hunters who probably have never spoke to each other. Uh, it gives me cause to think about this of uh, just, <laughs> you know, uh, are, are we at a different time where we don't talk to each other? And if we don't talk to each other, what does that mean for these topics? So uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Hal. Thanks to all of you who have listened to the first draft of this and looked over my, my script. Um, but I, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, one of the reasons I've never pushed the discussion on corner crossing to the degree we see it today is not just my hypersensitivity to private property rights, but also I've always tried to have a pragmatic view that many of these working landowners currently allow some access or a lot of access, or maybe they're enrolled in one of the state access programs. Many of them allow crossing at corners. And many of them share our same concerns about this erosion of the hunter-landowner relationship. And the reason I can say that with firm belief is I know many landowners. As their CPA, I see what challenges they face. And to me, they I, I can't look at these people as the abstract out-of-state billionaire who is pretty easy, let's face it, you know, it's pretty easy to demonize the, the out-of-stater, uh, whether you're a non-resident hunter or the non-resident landowner. To me, the landowners I know are great people, hardworking folks who share the same values that all of us have. So I have to think about it in the context of what are they going to feel if they get lumped into the same category as the new age landowner? either by actions of this new age non-resident landowner who is resetting the norms of neighborly consideration, or sometimes it's just we as hunters get lazy and we take the easy route and just want to lump all landowners into the same category. So I, I have cause to think about, oh, how does that play into this? And as the reason I do is I think about how I feel when Someone says, oh, damn, hunters, you know, we get all thrown and cast in the same mold because of the behavior of a few. And my first gut instinct is to push back and try to make a distinction of, oh, no, well, they're just the bad actors. And then there's the good, good hunters. Well, <laughs> we all have that response, right? And the same goes for landowners. Uh, so I always try to make sure I recognize the contribution to these amazing landscapes we have many of them being private landscapes. 
and the fact that they're trying to make a living while we're mostly doing this as a recreational passion. And I hope that prevents me from lumping all landowners into one category, because I feel like when I do that, I'd, it'd, it'd be lazy. And I mostly worry about the long run damage uh, to our joint interests when, when we do that. And I don't care if it's lumping all hunters together or lumping all landowners together. Uh, it's, it's not helpful. So I give all that consideration. Uh, you know, that, that hopefully gives you some idea of, of my view, but also how we proceed in the discussion I'm going to have with Tom and Nick, uh, it's, it's the, the idea that we have to focus on facts and on law. And we have to show respect for how these changes and these outcomes might impact all of us, probably affect all of us differently, but they're going to affect us nonetheless. So I think you're probably hearing in this my a transition in my approach to the topic where I've been way over here and then I've been over there and back in the middle and and it's all of my movement on that uh, is because of how my knowledge, my, my understanding of it has changed. I mean, my view went from the basic understanding of the principles at place, uh, at play. Uh, almost, uh, I almost took the acceptance of, well, the law is the law. It's how it always was and how it always will be case closed. Well, through years of study and hiring experts, I've now come to understand that the law is ever-changing. It's adapting. It's being amended by legislatures and Congress. It's being interpreted by the courts to reflect the realities of a changing society and a changing landscape. And from that, I've come to understand the reasons and the motivations why some would want to project the position of you know, I call it the absolutism that, you know, it's black and white. You know, this is how it is. Uh, and they stand there as though that's going to solve this intersection of private and public property rights. That's not going to settle it. Even though we know this issue is out there, uh, it's an issue that really has never been settled by the courts in any recent legal cases. And we have the changing of current technology. We have changing interests in accessing public lands. We have changing land ownership patterns. To say that this is black and white, settled, clear, absolute, because of how someone has been told it is, well, when you hear Tom and you hear Nick talk about it, you're going to find out. That's really not the case. There's a lot of undiscovered territory here. Uh, so my point is all this. I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, my ideas and thoughts on this intersection changes every time I have a discussion. Sometimes it doesn't change very much, and sometimes it might change quite a bit. And I plan to continue engaging legal experts on the topic. So I fully expect that the more I engage legal experts and the more I learn, I'm going to have more evolution in my thoughts about where private and public property rights intersect. I think there's a lot of value in having legal experts give opinions, give perspectives that are not seldom presented in this discussion. So that's why I'm willing to invest the time, the money, and the effort to bring that type of information, that expertise to what I think is a very important topic and a topic that's only going to get more focus and more focus as the trends I identified earlier continue to merge. So anyhow, stay tuned. Uh, on Monday, March 7th, uh, we're going to publish part two, episode number 179. And there, the true legal experts... Tom Stone Cipher, Nick Vanden Boss, will get into the details, the law, the cases, legal theories, and probably gonna bring forth a lot of topics you haven't even thought about. So anyhow, thanks for being here. Look forward to all your comments after we roll out these first two episodes. When the sun came shining.